right, welcome back to Computer Science 50. This is the start of week two, and that is your random internet humor for the day. It would have been much cooler, perhaps, if I'd brought an actual controller with me and gotten rid of the YouTube hint there, but uh, that was, uh, I don't know about you, but there were parts there where I was actually like a little tense for the guy. That's kind of remarkable. Anyhow, that's your setup for problem set one, which we'll talk about in a bit. But first, let's reveal some of the data that we gathered in addition to your sectioning surveys. So the data this year came out similar to last, whereby in yellow here, those are those of you who are somewhere in between, and green, those of you who described yourselves as less comfortable, and then those of you who described yourselves as more. So the point of offering up this data is, if nothing else, to point out, no matter which of these colors you're in, that there are plenty of other people in the course like you. So with that said, how about a more specific background, since it's this uh, assumption every year that many students make, particularly those less comfortable, that most everyone in the class has taken some computer science course or courses, particularly the AP. In fact, over 250 of you have not, in fact, taken AP computer science, and just a minority, in fact, have. Um, as for what computers you have, um, this was perhaps not surprising these days. Almost everyone on campus has a laptop. You'll notice that this does not, in fact, sum to 100%. It's not an error. It just means that a few of you, perhaps those more comfortable, have two or three computers, according to the data. How about operating systems? So this is kind of remarkable, though, again, perhaps not surprising these days. Mac OS has certainly resurged over the past few years. Um, here, too, these numbers don't add up to 100% either, but again, because of the uh, multiplicity of computers, though some of you, just under 5%, are running your own instances of Linux. Uh, how about some fluffy numbers? Uh, most, all, almost all of you have cell phones, and in fact, most of those are normal cell phones, but just under 10% of you have iPhones, Blackberries. Um, sad for Palm, none of you have a trio. Um, and then uh, some of you have other such devices. Carriers, Verizon is the most popular on campus, at least within CS50, followed by AT&T, followed by T-Mobile, Sprint, and just a couple of you have Nextel. And if, in fact, you were wondering, the data did, in fact, confirm that Mather is the best house. <laughs> So with that said, what are we going to be up to this week? Well, this phrase here is an example, a silly example, of something that's been enciphered or encrypted. And we'll come back to that. But if it looks unfamiliar to you, perhaps you'll remember this film, which is played on loop 24-7 uh, around the week of Christmas every year, unlike TNT or TBS. But a couple of announcements. One handout today. Uh, both the lecture slides as well as the code are in one packet today. Sections. You should have received an email from our bot in informing you of what your section assignment is. And now begins the onslaught of section request changes. Go ahead, per that email, and email Jansu, the course's head teaching fellow, at her email address on the website or in that email. If you suddenly realize that you can't make some section, uh, any other questions, send her way or mine. Office hours and virtual office hours. So now that problem set one is out the door, thus begins the course's massive support structure. So if you go to the office hours link on the course's website, you'll notice that this is our roster of office hours for not just this week, but pretty much every week recurringly. So this is a combination of physical office hours as well as virtual, um, just because we can, and also because it makes our lives a lot easier these days to manage our own office hours internally. This is Google Calendar's depiction of the same day. You'll note that very few of us are actually up and doing anything before like 4 PM, um, but we have concentrated office hours there. In purple are the virtual, and in blue are the uh, physical. Sections as well, if, for instance, some week you can't make your own section. Um, just pull up the sections page here, and similarly, will you see the other options color coded according to more, less, or somewhere in between comfort levels? So, all of that data is available to you. And again, we will do our best to accommodate any section changes. Uh, so, virtual office hours and this thing called Express Lane. So how do you actually get yourself on that internet and tune in to virtual office hours? Well, we'll defer largely to a handout that's on the course's website. If you go to virtual terminal room during any block of time where there's one or more TFs on duty there, you'll notice some explanations here as well as a link to a handout called How to Attend Virtual Office Hours. It's only two, three pages, mostly screenshots, pretty much walks you through the very simple process. Ultimately, uh, to attend these things, you would click Enter VTR. And what that would pull up after downloading once the requisite software is what's pretty much a glorified chat room. So the company that makes the software is called Illuminate. The software is called Illuminate. And what you have here in a nutshell is at top left, you'll see everyone who's logged into the VTR at once. Right now, I'm the only such person. Um, down at bottom left, you'll see a chat window, not unlike 
AIM or whatnot, where you can chat back and forth either with each other or the teaching fellows in the room. But then on the right hand side here is where the neat stuff happens.、Um, this software is powerful in that it allows us to either see what's on your screen or even take control of your computer, literally move your mouse, type、um, commands, type letters that appear then on your screen if you approve, whatever pop ups、uh, ask you for permission.、Um, and it's proved a wonderful way for us to hold office hours, frankly, in the middle of the night or spontaneously if someone has a question that's more easily answered by actually seeing what's on their screen or helping them move the mouse、uh, to accomplish some task.、Um, but I would say that these virtual office hours are self selecting.、Um, We too looked at data last year, which said that there was a subset of students who loved this. They liked the convenience. They liked the ability not to have to stroll across campus to the basement of the Science Center for physical office hours. And then there were certainly some students who just、eh, wasn't for them. It was too slow. It's not their thing. They prefer human contact. And that was fine too, which is why we have plenty of physical office hours as well. So it is entirely up to you if and when you drop by. In addition, though, to this virtual terminal room、um, and normal physical office hours, we're going to introduce one. Experiment this year to redress one problem that arose last year, which was that of wait times. Because there were 200 plus students last year, 300 plus students this year, many of whom like to converge on the basement of the Science Center or this VTR around like 7 p.m. on Thursday night、uh, to, uh, to dive into the problem set. We tend to get hammered at certain times during the week, which is also why you see us clumping together、um, during these office hours. But many students last year found that there were some times when they just had. Literally a 60 second question, or they just needed some question answered just so that they could get past some stumbling block. And so, what we're going to try to do to optimize our own throughput, so to speak, is have two lines at these office hours. And you'll see how it works when you go to the basement. You write your name on the board for now, and then we、uh, iteratively go through the board and walk over to where you're seating,、uh, seated.、Um, This year, though, we'll have two such lists. And if you decide for yourself fairly accurately, this really is just a quick question. I don't really need help. I just need a quick answer, yes or no. There'll be a so called express lane where you just put your name on a different list or on the website, you click the express lane link instead. And we'll try to see if this helps us get more people through the door by answering the quick questions quickly and then spending more time as needed, 5, 10, 15 minutes with the students who really need some、um, human assistance with working through some bug or some challenge. Challenge. So, more on that when you arrive.、Uh, scribe notes. So, if you haven't seen all of the resources that we make available are on the course's website, in addition to scribe notes from two of our staff members, Anjali and Andrew, under lectures. If you've not seen such things before, just click on notes and you will see pretty much documentation of everything that happened. Um, sometimes jazzed up or made to be more serious or more funny、um, based on what happened during that lecture. They're meant to be particularly good uses,、uh, resources for quiz time. And fi- finally,、uh, two announcements. If you were among those more comfortable who did the hacker edition, great.、Um, we're going to ask for the scratch boards back this Wednesday during lecture. So as you file in, one of the TFs will have a box of some sort. Make sure we check your name off in some form so that we don't come term billing you at the end of the semester.、Um, if you forget at that point, simply bring them to next Monday's lecture as well in the、uh, plastic bag with everything we handed to you. And finally, A word on problem sets. So, this first problem set is out the door, and it's、uh, first problem set focusing on C. It does have a slight Mario spin to it, hence this morning's、uh, little video teaser, but it also has a number of other problems as well. And if you've not looked at it yet, you'll note that one of the programming、uh, problems within the problem set, whether you do standard or hacker edition, chal- challenges you to learn a little something about ISBN numbers, the things on the backs of books in the store or the library.、Um, very simple things indeed. And then challenges you to write a program that validates those codes. Because, like credit card numbers, they follow a sort of formula that you can very easily check. And you can do it even without knowing many of C's more powerful features. And so we'll begin with that.、Uh, it also introduces the notion of a greedy algorithm. If you, next time you go to a store, at least be cognizant, if you've never been before, of what they're doing, say, at CVS when they hand you change. Odds are the cashier's drawer is laid out in such a way that there's $20 bills, then tens, then fives, then ones, and then the change. Similarly, follows a similar、um, monotonically decreasing sorted order. And that's a useful thing because so long as a cashier has enough of、uh, bills and coins, the most efficient way to give someone change is literally to go from left to right, from biggest denomination to smallest denomination. And by that, by op,、uh, most efficient, I mean that they're going to end up handing that customer the fewest number of bills or coins possible because this is a greedy approach. 
where you take as big a bite out of the problem again and again and again, actually gets you to zero, use zero change do using the fewest number of coins or nodes possible. And so that's a notion that we'll introduce in this problem set. It's an example of an algorithmic technique that's useful far beyond such real world things as change making, but will challenge you with actually implementing an algorithm that counts. The number of coins or bills do. And if you take up the hacker edition, we're going to throw a little、uh, wrench into the works whereby we're going to say, you know what, that cashier might be out of a certain denomination. And you'll find that if you're out of, say, $10 bills or five cent coins, that actually screws up this algorithm such that you might end up handing the person, as has happened to me at CVS before, way more like $1 bills than you'd actually be happy with. So the last problem is to challenge you to implement sort of a visualization of some part of Mario. But because this is a pretty meaty problem set, like all of them in the course, and because most of you are relatively new to C and even to Linux and the command line, what we're going to start with this problem set are these so called walkthroughs. So every Monday, henceforth, that there's a problem set out,、uh, there will be a so called code walkthrough on Monday nights from 6 to 7 30 p.m.、Um, this is in the brand new building on Oxford Street, roughly across from Maxwell Dworkin, the CS building. It's 52 Oxford. Go down the main stairwell there, and it's a very beautiful building. There's a big lecture hall where Cato, one of our teaching fellows, will be leading these weekly walkthroughs. And it's at these walkthroughs, frankly, that if you are sort of feeling, where do I even begin? Or this stuff is already sort of over my head. I mean, these things are precisely for that purpose to say, all right, here's the problem set. Here's what you have to do. Here's how you can begin. Let's now think through. How you might tackle each of these programs, each of these problems. And so it will also be filmed, put online by Wednesdays,、um, so that if you can't make those things, this will be your canonical source to turn to when you have questions of the form. Where do I even begin? And this too is meant to address that issue of wait time, because the teaching fellows now, if we find a student arriving at office hour saying, I have no idea where to begin. Help me. Well, we're going to help you by referring you first to that canonical source of information. And then we can field the more interesting, the more challenging problems、uh, with you in person. So, any questions of any sort related to these logistics or others? Anything at all? No? All right. So, what does this say? We've had like 10 minutes. What does it say? Yes, be sure to drink your oval teen. But why? Why that sentence? Do you remember that from the movie? Or, okay, so if you've seen the movie, there's the answer. But it turns out it kind of checks out, right? B E space S H U、uh, S U R E. <laughs> I went to Harvard.、Um, Uh, so, why, though, is this the case that that actually represents that English sentence? Well, this is an example of a very simple cipher, a, an algorithm with which you can scramble or hide the true meaning of information known as a Caesar cipher. And we'll come back to this on Wednesday. But all we've simply done here to translate be sure to drink your Ovaltine into this so called cipher text is do what, does it seem? Yeah. Yeah, we've kind of rotated all of the letters, it turns out in this case, by 13 places. So A becomes B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, because that's 13 places away. And similarly, do all of the other letters get incremented by 13 places? And if you end up hitting Z and have to wrap around, well, you go back from Z to A. So it's an example, actually, of something that for years was called rot. 13, ROT 13. And back in the day when people really still used Usenet and other types of bulletin boards, and you wanted to kind of scramble your information so that, say, no one could really see what you had written unless they, one, know how you enciphered that information, or two, actually chose to go through the effort of translating your ciphertext back to plain text, well, they would use what's called ROT 13 to just scramble their information, albeit not very securely. And in fact, if you're really becoming quite the geek,、uh, you'll See eventually, perhaps in your life, someone who has some stupid signature of the day which says this email has been encrypted with ROT13 twice for double the protection. <laughs>、ah, see? The world's starting to make more sense. So, Let's now, before we dive into that sort of prop domain for actually deploying some of these skills, let's take a look at what we've been doing and what else you can do after a course like this. So, even though we're going to focus for several weeks on this language known as C, what we're doing is not all that dissimilar from writing programs in C, Java, Lisp, a language you'll get introduced to if you take it, and CS51, Perl, PHP. These languages are used for different purposes, whether it's web based software or.、Um, 
uh, client side software, but syntactically, with the exception perhaps here of Lisp, they're all quite similar. So, in fact, what I'm going to do here is just load up hi.cc. And we're not going to spend time on the syntax here, but if you wanted to write a hello world program, well, if you wanted to do it in C, you would write something like this. A little different, but once you know what the different keywords and tokens mean, it's not all that dissimilar to C. If we wanted to do the same thing in Java, well, it looks like this. So, those of you who did take AP Computer Science will find this completely trivial to write. But here, too, there's otherwise a lot of seemingly、uh, cryptic syntax. But again, there's some similarities. Main, there's the mention of this thing called a string. Clearly, some of the punctuation is the same. Another such language,、uh, what else do we got? In Perl. So, hi.pl in Perl. Well, print exists in many such languages. So, that is to say, it's not going to be hard by course's end to pick up other languages、uh, than C. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we've introduced as of last year PHP into the course. And this teach you C per se. Because at the end of the day, who really cares if you can speak a particular language? But if you can use a particular language and use other languages or pick up other languages, that,、uh, that itself is a much more powerful takeaway. And so, hopefully, you will learn from this course to bootstrap yourself into other languages. Still. So let's start with a little warm up question here. So in buggy1.c, I have the following source code. It is buggy for what reason?、And、the purpose of this program is to print 10 stars onto the screen, one after the other. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a newbie mistake, but not uncommon, certainly. This loops is fine. This loop here is fine, but notice that I'm, if I'm starting to count at zero, that's fine, but I better not count up to 10, but rather stop at 9. So there's two obvious ways to fix this. One requires that I do what? I'll just delete that, right? Or I can just substitute 10 for 9, or I can start counting from 1, or dot, dot, dot. So again, many different ways to solve these kinds of problems. So easy one there, but not uncommon to make. What about buggy 2? So, this too is supposed to print 10 asterisks, but it does not. Why this time? Oh, 10 stars, one per line, but it does not. Why is that? Well, there's the same bug as before, but why does this program, if I run it, and again, I'm going to compile this with make buggy 2, buggy going to head and run buggy 2. So, hmm. I wanted one per line, right? And I should have gotten that because, again, I have a, a printf of a new line character indented under there just like the printf. Someone from this side, yeah. What? Yeah, so this is another sort of dumb mistake, but that's very easy to make early on. Recall that we said if you ever want to do multiple things within the context of an if statement or a loop, a condition, you need to actually encase them with. Curly or squiggly braces here. So that now means go ahead and execute both of those. Previously, even though it looked like、ah, those things should both happen at once, white space is irrelevant to almost everyone except the human. And so even though I indented it, that has no fundamental meaning. If I actually want them both to happen together, I do in fact need to have, say, the curly braces. So just to hammer that home, let me add the curly braces there. Make, remake buggy2. And rerun buggy2, and there. Now we actually have them printing one per line. So, pretty easy. And、uh, I would urge you, if you're at all curious about the history of some of this stuff, this is what is considered to be the first bug in a computer program, as it was quite literally a bug in one of the earliest of computers. But Wikipedia is your friend if you're curious for the story. So, now let's start to do, prove to you something that we claimed we could do, or that computers did in week zero. So, we said in week zero that computers can store, obviously, Zeros and ones, and with those zeros and ones, they can represent more interesting pieces of data like characters or punctuation symbols. And what was the key point? How is it that a computer who's capable only of zeros and ones and thus numbers in binary, how can it go about representing letters like A through Z as well?、And、what was sort of the key trick that it used there? So, how does a computer represent letters? 
Yeah, so using just numbers. If all you have as means of expressing yourself are numbers, well, then you've kind of got to arbitrarily decide all right, henceforth, this number is going to represent not just the number 65, but in certain contexts, that which, in which we expect characters to appear on the screen, a 65 should in, be, instead be interpreted as a 65. So, what is this mapping? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and go to this website that most people use, even though it's a little scary looking, ASCIITable.com. This is one of those really easy websites to make. You make it once, you put it on the web, and done. Everyone thereafter always goes to you as the canonical source. This is just one huge graphic. And what this graphic shows, albeit with some additional information we don't need today, is that if you wanted to find out what the decimal Equivalent is for the capital letter A, where my cursor is here. Well, in the decimal column at far left is the number 65. And then meanwhile, B is 66, C is 67. And then later in the course, we'll likely talk about such things as hexadecimal notation and octal notation, which is just base, uh, uh, base uh, different bases like base 16. And more. So we'll cover that in different contexts still, but all that's the only takeaway for now is that we need to represent characters somehow with numbers. Well, if that is indeed the case, the computers are doing this for al already, can we see as much? So what I have here in ASCII1.c. As perhaps a proof of concept. So I've stripped from my versions here electronically all of the comments so as not to spoon feed some of these、uh, questions. What does this program here, looking up and not down, Appear to do for us? Yeah, it prints the letters of the alphabet. Well, why is that? Well, we have two for loops, which again, you're probably getting more visually comfortable with. It looks like this for loop starts counting at i equals 65, hint, hint, letter A perhaps. It's going to go up to 26 positions later than that because I just did 65 plus 26 inside of the so called、uh, condition of my for loop. And then what am I printing here? Well, we're now using multiple format strings. So what's going to print here to the left of the colon according to that string? So, percent C, kind of guess, right? Character. So, that's whatever the character or letter is, colon. Then, percent D, we said was a digit or a decimal digit. So, it looks like this thing is going to print character number, but it's in a loop. So, character number, character number, character number, dot, dot, dot. Well, let's go ahead and look before we even look at the second statement there. This is ASCII 1. I'm going to run ASCII 1. Not all that interesting, but it does, in fact, show. That there is this mapping. But wait, this is not that hard to just generate the letters of the alphabet. But notice we've done it entirely numerically and using this trick known as typecasting or casting. So notice that printf again has two placeholders give me a character and give me a digit. But nowhere yet. Do we have any such characters? We've only discussed integers. There's an int i for my index variable, and then there's these hard coded numbers like 65. But notice that in printf's additional arguments, am I passing the number or the variable i twice? But in the first case, I'm explicitly saying, you know what? Treat this number not as a number, but as a character. That is, whatever it represents underneath the hood in terms of a through z or whatnot, print that instead. Now, down here, what's this doing? Clearly, based on the output we just saw. Yeah, so that's just printing the lowercase letters. And I just knew that the lowercase letters start at 97, and then there's going to be 26 of them as well. And so I printed that loop as well. Well, what can we do to sort of make this a little cleaner? Well, this is ASCII 2. Dot C. And my only goal here was to sort of demonstrate slightly better formatting, because it's not all that useful if it's just a huge list and then subsequently I, the user, have to scroll back up. So, what if I wanted to do something very reasonable like two columns of these things, right? Let's think about now how we can format information, not terribly interesting information, but at least in a way that we can sort of borrow the same idea when we start writing more interesting programs and don't want to just put text on the left hand side from top to bottom, but want to maybe spread things out and make more interesting user interfaces. So here again, we seem to have percent %C, percent %D, so character number, then a bunch of white space. What's this say here? Percent %3D. How is that different? When we saw this in the context of that progress bar on Wednesday. So the three is going to do what for me? 
Yeah, reserve three spaces, three dot, 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 placeholders for whatever number is going to go there, even if that number is only one digit or two digits. It will still take up three spaces. And that's useful, as we saw the other day, for aesthetic reasons, or in this case, too, for sort of formatting or layout reasons. So it's kind of cryptic here, but well, we're saying first put the first char, i, and that goes in this placeholder, then put the digit, then put another digit, i plus 32, for some reason. And then put another char, which is again i plus 32. So, what's the net result here? So, this is ASCII 2. Let's run ASCII 2. Okay, so it's not all that different. So, why did I do the 32? Well, if you now realize, oh, well, so if capital A is 65 and lowercase a is 97, the difference between them is 32. So, I can sort of count up simultaneously in both lists by just taking i from 65 on up and just plus 30, uh, add 32 to it to sort of get the right hand column. So again, not terribly sexy, but it certainly demonstrates that you can, in, there is in fact this inherent mapping between letters and numbers, and we can also do slightly more interesting things now with formatting. Now it turns out this is a bit of a white lie, because even in this simple example, even though I stated char i in both cases, for printf and some other functions, you didn't really need to do that. So yes, this is a notion, uh, this is an instance of casting a number to a character, an int to a char, but printf would have figured it out because if handed a number but told to print a char, it would have done that conversion for us, just so you know. But let's take a look at one last example involving these characters. Just to hit home the point that, you know, numbers, letters, they're kind of the same thing underneath the hood. So if we really want to, or if we really want to think about these things this way, we could also do a for loop like this, which is kind of blasphemy when it comes to the, what some of the canonical examples we've looked at, because nowhere is there an int. There's no i here, but instead there's c. But I can initialize this char c to a capital A, and I can tell the compiler, well, iterate and up until the point when this character equals capital Z, what do I want to do each time? Well, just to be clear what incrementation is happening here, what do I want to do? Well, I first want to take the value of c, cast it to an int, so now it's a number, add 1 so that I go 1 next in the alphabet, but then I need to print out a c again, so I'm going to cast it back to a char. So I cast it temporarily to an int with the inner int cast. I add my one, then I cast it back to a char. But again, this is the, for the sake of being explicit. Printf would have, in the four, and GCC would have figured out what we were doing without needing to be this explicit. But we'll see examples in which this explicit casting is quite useful. So just to show what this does, make ASCII 3 and run this program. It's the same as the first, but with just a different implementation. Well, any questions on ASCII or that mapping? Yeah. Ah, it's a good question. So could we change this to the C++, no pun intended there, of when, whoops, what did I do there? So I opened the binary file, the zeros and ones, nano or vim here is kind of freaking out because it doesn't know what's in there. It does appear actually that there's strings inside this program. And so if you don't mind my um, uh, diverting for just one second, it turns out that there's a program on most Linux computers called strings such that if you run strings on the binary, what that program does is something similar, but it analyzes the whole program looking for every instance of ASCII characters, not zeros and ones. And this will be very useful, for instance, if you take CS61, uh, uh, one of whose first problem sets tasks you with cracking a binary that's going to explode if you don't provide the right password. Well, if uh, Professor Welsh in that course next year doesn't quite embed the password very securely, simply running something like strings will dump out whatever string was hard coded into the program, such as a password. So, little hacker tricks, and uh, you owe me the points if you get that next year. All right. What was the question at hand? ASCII3.c. Well, can I just simplify and change this whole incrementation block, which is arguably a little excessive, to just C? Well, let's go ahead and run this. Make ASCII3. Seems to compile okay. ASCII3. Seems also to check out. So absolutely. So C itself and GCC doesn't really care about these subtle differences, but certainly as we're introducing the topics, it sort of, lend, um, sort of behooves us, or at least me, to be explicit about it. But now let's sort of use these building blocks to do something more interesting. So this program here, 
called Battleship.c. It doesn't actually play Battleship or let us do anything much at all, but it does demonstrate that with these basic building blocks, can we start to make even primitive user interfaces or game interfaces? You might recall from growing up, Battleship is that game where you put all those little plastic ships in this grid of holes that have、uh, rows and columns, and then you、uh, try to guess where the other person has put their same ships. Well, we wanted to kind of recreate that board visually. We didn't actually get around to implementing the game, but if I spoil what the code is actually doing, I'm going to make Battleship and then run Battleship. And now, just with these basic building blocks, can I do things that now are arguably more interesting? Because now I can create even an interactive game if, in just some kind of loop, for instance, I just keep asking the user, give me an int, give me a char, so that I can do something like A1 or B10. So you can already imagine using the very simple functions we've been using thus far, actually responding to user input and maybe updating what this picture looks like. So, more on that in future problem sets. So, now let's sort of do something more interesting. And even C is more fun if we can somehow tie Homer Simpson to it. All right? So, thanks to Google Images for that. And now, this annoying song from camp and from riding the bus, if you ever sang this thing. So, 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall is one of the most annoying songs because it is so damn repetitious. It just keeps repeating again and again and again, except for subtle differences, namely the number that you're calling out. And then, if you're being really anal at the end, whether you're using a singular word or a plural word, At the very end. So there's some interesting opportunities there to sort of do things conditionally or to decrement or certainly to loop ad nauseum or at least 99 times. So, how could we go about implementing something like this? Well, let's take a look at beer1.c. So, this actually, let's go ahead and run it first so that it's、uh, contextualized for us. So, make beer1. I'm going to go ahead and run beer1. How many bottles would there be? Audience participation 99, I heard. All right, so that was pretty damn fast. But if I now scroll through this program's buffer, they are actually all there. And the only reason they're not is because I sort of ran out of buffer space. So I'd have to actually reconfigure Putty, the terminal program I'm using, to actually remember more lines of code. But they are all there. And in fact, today's sort of Linux y trick if you know some command or program you're about to run, it's going to spit out a whole lot of output and it's going to go by way too fast for you to actually see it. One of the techniques you'll see in DOS and in Linux is that you can pipe the, command, the output of one command into the input of another command. There is a command on Linux called more, and there's also one called less, which almost do the same thing. So, beer1's output is now going to become more's input, and more's purpose in life is to only show you one screen of something, zero screens of something. Well, that's strange. Beer. Well, that's very strange. Well, that is fascinating. All right, so we have a terminal problem. So, in correctly configured putty sessions, that would work. So, we'll use that as a teaser for my own. Oh, that's why. That's why. David's not being very smart. Okay. There we go. All right, so what happened was I forgot the program actually takes user input. So if I actually run, we'll do it with the more explicit one, pipe beer1's output into more's input, what I forgot was, you know, I was sort of being dumb here, waiting for the program when really it's waiting on me. But the problem is I can't see that it's waiting for me because where did its output go? This program called more, which by definition only shows you content when it's ready to fill up an entire screen. So I'm caught in this weird limbo state, but if I remember how to run the program and just type 99 enter, aha, there's my output. And notice now what more is doing for me is saying hit the space bar effectively if you want more and more of this output. So, useful trick, especially when you know you're going to get a lot of output. All right, so with that said, How did this work? It is annoying if you're running this testing it late at night. So, beer1.c. So, how did we do this? So, we have some basic building blocks. One, we're using CS50's library to, get, to do what, probably? Right? CS50's library exists pretty much for the purpose of making your life easier when it comes early on in the semester for just getting user input. Because as we'll see next week, as we peel back the layers of CS50's library, it's actually non trivial to do very 
conceptually simple things like ask the user for an integer or ask the user for a string. So we sort of do that for you early on. So this program is going to print how many bottles of beer will there be. We then get an int via CS50's get int. Recall that we do have to include this so that you have access to that. Now, this is an example of what we'll generally call just error checking, right? One of the sort of principles we'll be looking for you to adhere to, certainly when doing problem sets, is bug freeness in, in, in the ideal sense, whereby there should be no situation in which we, the staff, or any other user can break your code just by providing some input that you weren't expecting. And even though in the course, in the course's context, you might find us a bit draconian when it comes to finding this bug and that bug, I mean, think about your own computers. It's as annoying as hell if your program crashes or does something that you're not expecting, but it's so terribly easy to do so, as you'll soon see. So this is just doing what? If the user types in a number that just doesn't make sense, well, let's just exit right away. Now, how do we exit? Well, one of the things we will see today is that even though we've not done it thus far, main, which is that function, the default function inside of any program, actually can return a value, a sort of error code or a success code. And by default, the world has decided that any time a program works perfectly as planned, its return code or exit code should be zero. Because there's one notion, it's very simple to imagine something either works or it doesn't. And if it works, we're going to say its return code is zero. But unfortunately, computers and programs are so complicated, there's arguably an infinite number of things that can go wrong. Well, if we've already used zero to specify success, we're going to use, by convention, any number of positive numbers to represent error codes. So in this case, I'm returning one because this is the first possible error code that might happen. And so, in fact, when you're using your own computer, henceforth, if you ever notice a, a pop up window or a dialog window saying, uh, this application quit unexpectedly, error code something, some number, it's because the programmer has pretty much hard coded a value like this to signify, really, for the developer's purposes, what it was that went wrong. Unfortunately, telling the user that you had a negative 39 error is not all that uh, instructive for them, but for the person who wrote it, probably quite useful. Yeah? Uh, good question. Can you only return ints? Yes, the return type for a C function in main is in it. But in other functions, it can be anything we want. Can you create a main that is an non-int? It no, it has, it's expected to be an int. That's the expect you can do void, but it's supposed to be an int. So with that said, how do we implement this thing? Well, we now have in memory in what variable the number of bottles of beer to print at this point in the story. That's stored in n, right? That's the variable we defined up there. So what's this for loop going to do? Well, we can do this any number of ways, but intuitively, it's probably pretty simple if we start with n equals 99 or whatever the user typed in and then do something again and again and again, decrementing n each time until n equals, well, 0 or 1, depending on how we want the verses to play out. Well, this is, again, going to use our little printf tricks. How is this loop going to work? It's first going to say print some number of bottles of beer on the wall, then the next line. Print some number of bottles of beer. What number? Well, i. And why i? Well, because I'm using i as just my index counter. I wanted to remember, for whatever reason, what the original value was. So I didn't want to keep doing n minus minus, n minus minus, because then eventually I'd have forgotten what the user typed in, which is arguably not good if I care about that value ultimately. So I'm just using i as a temporary variable. So once I've printed these two lines, then I'm going to say take one down, pass it around. And then it gets slightly interesting because I need to now decrement the total number of bottles of beer on the wall. But I need to do it sort of dynamically. So some simple arithmetic gives me that effect. Well, let's rerun this thing. So if I rerun uh, beer one with just, let's say, four bottles so that it fits on the screen. Well, four bottles of beer on the wall, four bottles of beer, take one down, pass it around, three bottles of beer on the wall, hence the minus one. And then the decrementation happens. And then it repeats again and again and again. So certainly a good candidate for a looping construct, but it's also another it's also a candidate for something sort of more fundamental than this. So if we take a look now at beer2.java, let's see how we can clean this thing up. So one, we could take a different syntactic approach altogether, just based on your recollection of the previous example. What's the only thing that's different here? So we're using a while loop. Does it matter? Not really. It's pretty much just as readable. I need to do the decrementation manually down here. But again, the takeaway here is just there's many different ways to solve what are otherwise um, pretty obvious goals or obvious problems. But what if I wanted to recognize, you know what? 
that loop there is sort of a prime candidate to be factored out. So there's this big fancy word known as hierarchical decomposition. And what this means is look for sort of interesting chunks of code in your main function that you can rip out and put into their own. Functions, their own mini programs, so that you can call them much like you are calling get int or get float. That is, if you can sort of imagine a chunk of code being conceptually distinct from everything else that's going, around, going on around it, well, you can factor it out and wrap it in its own function so that you can simplify your main routine. So we see this in beer 3. C. So again, the top of the program is almost identical. How many bottles of beer will there be? We get an int. We check the value of that int to do some error checking. And now I do still have, oh, I got ahead of myself. We do still have、um, a for loop here. Let's skip this one. We'll come back to this. The one I wanted was beer four. Notice here that I seem to have ripped out the loop in, or most of the loop in question. So, this code is kind of shorter, it's simpler, because what is obviously now missing from right there in the bottom of the screen? All of those printf lines. Well, where did they go? But conceptually, that was kind of like the song's chorus. I wanted to print something again and again and again. So, just be kind of nice if I can think of that as now print the chorus. Well, I seem to have done that somehow by saying while n, which is another kind of neat trick, do this. Well, this is indented below. It turns out chorus. Is a function, a mini program that I wrote. Well, where is this? It's got to be for now in the same file. And in fact, if I scroll down to the bottom of this file, in addition to main, it looks like I've defined my own function. So syntactically, functions are pretty much like main. I first specify what the return type is. And we'll get more into more detail on this, but this just means what the function returns. So get int, for instance, returns what? Right, an int, get float, returns a float, get string, returns a string. But chorus, it doesn't need to really return anything. All I want chorus to do is print something. It's a function with what's called a side effect. It does something visually, but doesn't actually return anything useful per se. So if you have no datum to return, no int, no string, no float, we could just say void. This function doesn't return anything whatsoever, it just does something. Well, the function is going to be called chorus. And chorus is parenthetically specified as taking what? An int called b. So, what's neat about functions is that you can influence their behavior by passing them values, passing them what are called arguments. And in fact, we've seen and used many times already a standard C function that itself takes arguments. Used it four times in the past several examples. Printf, 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 right? The first argument to printf is the quote unquote string that you want to print, and the second and the third and the fourth dot 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 arguments to printf are whatever variables you actually want to plug into that function's string, that first argument's string. So we can do the same thing. Chorus is sort of useful for me as a, like a utility function because I can just call it again and again and again, but each time pass it a different value. Call it n that represents the current verse that I want to sing. So this function here returns nothing. It's called chorus. It takes an int arbitrarily called b, but for number of bottles was my, my point. Then down here, we'll ignore this for the moment, does the following it prints something, something of beer on the wall, comma b. Comma s1, and we'll ignore s1 again for a moment. But b is now just the current value. So on the first time chorus is called, that's going to be the number 99. The second time chorus is called, it's going to be 98. And similarly, is b inserted into these other printf calls? So the end result, if I go ahead and run or first compile beer four, and then run beer four at the prompt and do four bottles of beer, the effect is exactly the same. But what I've done with the code is now factored out again this sort of conceptually distinct part and also deployed some other fancy tricks. So before we tease apart what some of those tricks are, who cares? Like, why is this perhaps a useful thing? Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually, so when you're working with a team, you said? 
Yeah, so this is actually a very compelling reason. If you end up liking this kind of stuff, software development and go off to work or intern for some company, your odds are not going to be writing code alone. You're going to be writing code with someone else, not so much at the same computer <laughs> watching over each, shoulder, each one's shoulder, but rather you're going to decide in advance all right, you go implement this list of functions, I'll go implement this list of functions. Let's decide in advance what they look like, that is, what their return values are, and what types of parameters they take, so that when I'm writing my code, I'm just going to assume that this. This function exists because you're eventually going to implement it for me. So, same here, same thing here. Even though, again, this would be kind of a silly program to outsource to someone else, and for the course's purpose,、uh, let's not go outsourcing functions. But in this case here, You could tell someone, go implement chorus. It's got to print out this stupid verse, and here's how it's got to be structured. I'm just going to assume that however you implement this thing, I get to pass in an int, and you get to deal with the printing. So, that is, in fact, a compelling reason. What else might be a compelling reason as to why we factored out those four lines of code? Yeah. Absolutely. So the principle I'll, I'll label that with is. Many other contexts because it's not a terribly useful function on a day to day basis. But certainly, if there is some kind of functionality that would be nice to use here in your program and here in your program, well, your first inclination might be to go copy. With, by highlighting and copy some code you wrote that you know works, if you need to do it again, paste it in here, paste it in here when you need to use it yet again. But this is precisely what functions are for factor out some common chunk of code so that you can reuse it or others can reuse it. Any other thoughts? Yeah. What's that? Readability. So that too is a good one. This, again, is a relatively small program, but when you start writing much longer, much more sophisticated programs, it's going to become very difficult to read it top to bottom as a human and then remember,、oh、God, what was it I saw 50 lines ago? But if you can sort of simplify the code by describing with functions names, Chorus happens here. You don't need to see the five or the ten or the thirty lines of code that implement that functionality, the chorus. If you care to, you can then scroll to that point in the file. But it tends to be more readable if you factor out chunks of code and wrap them in functions because it makes your main function, for instance, much smaller. And you can much more quickly get a sense of it and then dive deeper, so to speak, if you care to see what those functions are doing. Well, now let's look at some of these tricks. First of all, why? Does this even work here? While n, right? Thus far, we've always seen sort of Boolean expressions in there. Why does this nonetheless get the job done? Yeah, exactly. So long as you don't do something stupid like do n plus plus ad nauseum, this thing is going to in fact get decremented n minus minus. And so long as we've required that the user give a non negative number or non zero number, rather, we're going to be able to do minus 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 minus. And on every iteration, the while loop is going to check while 99, while 98, while dot dot dot, while 2, while 1, while 0. But 0, as you know, is not true. It is by definition false. So the moment you hit the zeroth bottle of beer, this loop stops executing because zero is in fact false. What about this trick here? We've seen minus minus before. So there's also this neat trick. And that big table we showed you briefly last week that was the operator precedence as to what happens in what order, sometimes these things kind of matter. So even though I'm plugging in the number, say, 99 for n, what's going to happen here is the following. Actually, let's do a smaller number like four. So if I run beer four and give it four bottles of beer, notice that the very first verse to print, in fact, involves four bottles of beer. And yet, it looks like, if we look at beer four here, it looks like I'm doing, OK, a、so、while four, that's true. So I'm going to do an iteration, call chorus of n minus minus. So you would almost think that that's going to be passing to chorus what value? Three, right? Because you're passing an n minus minus, and we've seen in the context of like for loops that n minus minus means subtract one from n, but there is in fact two different types of increment decrement operators. So n minus minus is in many contexts different from n,、uh, sorry, minus minus n. So you can have the prefix version of this operator, minus minus, or the postfix version of this operator, and that simply speaks to in what order it's actually applied. So because I actually use the postfix version of it in this context, yes, n gets decremented. 
but when apparently? After the function gets called. So there are these little subtleties that frankly are not worth sort of stressing over because often if you kind of have to think about what the code's doing, that sort of violates the notion of readability. And so you should perhaps take another approach altogether. But we offer these really as sort of building blocks that you can deploy so that at least we've seen them in some context. Yeah? Well, so let me leave that as an at home exercise. Well, fine, don't do it now. <laughs> All right. It's easier for me to change three characters than actually expect that anyone's going to go home, tweak the code, recompile it on their own account, right? Beer four, four bottles of beer. Now it's wrong, right? In the sense that the decrementation happened first instead of last. Oh, good question. So, okay, so the question is so clearly, via all, several examples now, we've seen that we can accomplish the same task, the same annoying song, via many different ways. So, is the computer itself or is GCC actually doing something different? Short answer is it depends. If we actually got out a program like, um, uh, uh, a hex editor, as they're called, or if we actually got out a special program and looked, at the binaries that are being produced and looked at the patterns of zero and ones, very often, yes, if you use, say, a for loop here and a while loop here, the code that gets spit out by GCC might very well be different, even though the net effect is the same. But compilers are also very sophisticated these days. And so it's possible that you could write code in two different ways, but the resulting zeros and ones would, in fact, be the same. So the short answer is it depends. It depends on just how different the code you've written is. Good question, though. All right. Now let's try to do something more interesting with these functions and then realize we can't. So here's a function that, by its name, appears to exist so that it swaps the values of two variables. Very reasonable, especially when we start talking about things like sorting. Right? If you want to sort a whole bunch of things, odds are you're going to have to move some guys around, right? even when sectioning. If we wanted to sort section list, we needed to sort of swap pairs of people sometimes. Um, or rather, when we need to move people around, we, by nature, swap them. So this notion of swapping is certainly not uncommon. But it turns out that this program, which I encapsulated in a file called buggy3.c, doesn't work. So let's take a look. So buggy3.c looks like this, and it's among your printouts, though I did strip out all comments again from these things. So notice this program here. I first declare a variable x and give it arbitrarily the number 1. A variable y, give it the number 2. Then I just print what these values are, just to sort of be explicit with the user. x is such and such, y is such and such. Rather, x is 1, y is 2. Then I print out swapping, dot, 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 as though it's going to take a long time for this to happen. Then this is an example of a function call, right? Just like we've called printf before, called getint before, I'm calling swap. But notice, what is not to the left-hand side of this function call, as was with getint and get float? Right, there's no notion in this case of like left hand side and right hand side. There's no assignment. Like there's no say int foo get swap. But why was why uh, why is that or why might that be? Swap doesn't return anything. It's declared as a void function. So similarly with printf, we've never seen printf to the right hand side of an assignment operator because again printf just has side effects. It prints things out, but it doesn't actually do something for you. It doesn't get data from the user or anything like that and return some value. So this is similar then in spirit to printf. Notice I'm passing as the two arguments, x and y, the hope being that they're going to come back different. So I'm going to go ahead and make this bold claim, swapped. And then I'm going to remind the user what the swapped values now are. But it's buggy in this sense. If I do a uh, make of buggy3, and now run buggy3, it is completely broken. Right? I can claim all I want, swapped, as some of you might when turning in some problem sets and claiming done, but not so much in this case. So why is that? Well, let's take a look at what code we're using. So swap is a function. Where is it? It's somewhere in the file. By convention, we'll tend to preach that you put main functions at the top of the file so that no one has to go fishing for them along the lines of readability. But here we have 
below main, the swap function, it's void, so it doesn't return anything. Uh, it's called swap. It takes an int a and b. Notice that what you call numbers in one context don't have to be the same in another context. They're in different scopes, so to speak. So why does this not work? Well, what's going on here? I'm first declaring a temporary variable called temp. I'm then storing in that temporary variable the value of a. Then I'm changing a to be whatever's in b. And then I'm putting in b what was in a, aka temp. So at this point in the story, where my blinking or non blinking, blinking cursor is, are a and b swapped? Yeah, so they are, right? That's pretty reasonable. This or we needed a temporary variable because you can't just swap two variables like that because you're going to lose one of them in the process, right? That's why we have to remember one of them. Though that's a bit of a lie. You can actually do neat tricks at the bit level. If you actually think of your variables as zeros and ones, you literally can do this crazy thing where you move them simultaneously without losing either of the numbers and without needing a temporary variable. More on that in the future. But at this point in the story, A and B are different. And yet, when we run this program, x and y are not. So why might this be? Yeah. So it's clearly not returning the swapped variables values to x and y, right? Nowhere is there something like return a, nowhere is there return b, and it turns out you can't in C even do something like this. You can't return two values at once. To do that, you're actually going to need more sophisticated techniques like an array, which we'll see on Wednesday. So the values aren't being returned. And moreover, what, what else might be a, a good explanation of this? Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. So it turns out, and this is perhaps subtle now, but will become increasingly clear when you call a function, and that function takes arguments, and those arguments are integers or characters, even very simple things, primitive, so to speak. What you're actually passing in is not those actual variables. You're not passing in the block, the chunks of memory, tiny chunks of memory, 32 bits each, to that function and letting him, or, uh, him manipulate what's inside those variables. Rather, you're handing that function that you're calling literal copies. So not the same 32 bits, but an identical 32 bits. That this function then, in this case swap, is free to do anything it wants to because they're his own local copy, so to speak. But all the while, these variables up here, x and y, belong to main and therefore are not themselves touched. And so when we run this again, it's yes swapping A and B, but not in fact swapping X and Y. And let's see that. So let me copy this printf line and just down here put out two of these lines, say A is this and B is this, and then let me plug in A here and B here. Let me recompile the program, rerun it. Ah, so A and B are swapped, but X and Y is not. So how do we work around that? What's going on? Well, short answer is we're sort of SOL right now. We have no way of fixing that. We have no means of expressing that notion of swapping if we're outsourcing the swapping to some other function. Well, let's take a look at this example too and see what else we can't yet do. So in buggy four, notice that I have this notion of incrementation. So even simpler, I don't care about swapping variables. I don't need temporary variables. All I want to do is implement a function whose purpose in life is to do plus plus on some variable. Well, here's our variable x. It's initialized to one. I'm going to say x is now one, incrementing dot, dot, dot. I'm going to call this increment function. I'm going to claim incremented, but odds are, given this program's file name, buggy4.c, it's not going to work. Well, should this work? So increment returns void, so that's probably not good, at least if we're trying to get values back. Increment takes no arguments, that's fine, because it apparently is just assuming that x is what you want to increment. But in fact, if I try to compile this thing, make buggy four, whoa, all right. So in function increment, error, line 40, uh, x undeclared first use in this function. And then the same error seems to be recurring in different flavors. So how to interpret this? Well, this again is sort of a lesson unto itself. One, odds are GCC, when you compile something, is going to try to guess at what the problem is, or at least tell you what line choked it up. So let's go ahead and look at line 40, which you can count out, or in nano and also in Vim. Somewhere on the screen, you'll see what line you're on, which is useful. So you can move up and down and get to different lines. So line 40, all right, not all that helpful. So the problem is somewhere in swap. But what was the error? Well, let's run it again. Uh, let's, re let's recompile again. Er X undeclared, first use in this function. So it looks like 
buggy 4.c, it looks like it doesn't like the fact that I'm trying to touch a variable that wasn't declared, so to speak, in my same function. Because where was x declared? Apparently in main and not in this function called increment. So there's this notion now in C of scope. So every function has access to its own chunk of memory. And this is what's called a stack frame. And this will get more useful still and also have really interesting implications for security down the road as well. So if you think of this, this little rectangle here as representing RAM. So RAM is your computer's memory. You've got probably what, a gigabyte, two gigabytes of it these days. This box just represents the bottom of your RAM on up. And by default what happens when you run a program is the very first function to get called, like main, gets some default chunk of memory. And inside that chunk of memory goes all of its local variables variables, any of its arguments, things that you passed in. On top of that goes whatever function you call. So the moment a function called, like main calls a function called foo, what happens in memory is those two uh, horizontal bars, these little tr uh, frames, so to speak, get piled on top of mains in memory. That is, just they get added to your RAM's contents and then only inside of this part of RAM do foo's own local variables, or in this case parameters exist. Which is to say main has access to anything inside of its box, foo has access to anything inside of its box, but not clearly um, ones from another function. Okay, so in other words, in this case, main gets called, this thing here on the bottom gets pushed into memory. When this function call increment happens, another chunk of memory gets reserved by your operating system, put conceptually on top of that in main. Inside of that chunk of memory or any of increments local variables, unfortunately he has none, so in fact this little picture is really just smushed down in the sense that there's nothing in there. And then when foo is done executing, everything inside of his frame go away completely. Which is to say if we consider the previous example of swap, even though swap was doing useful work, it was swapping A and B, what happens to A and B the moment the swap function returns or ends, so to speak? That they go out of scope, so to speak. They're no longer valid values because the operating system forgets that they were once inside of memory as well. And I say this has interesting security implications because so many, I dare say a majority of the exploits that still happen today, um, whether it was the iPhone first getting cracked last year, uh, web servers getting compromised, other applications still getting broken into or serial numbers sort of circumvented, often boil down to those programs having been written in C or C++ or languages like these that give you really low level access to memory and someone made a bug in those programs, made a mistake where for instance they assumed that a variable was bigger than it actually was or they used what we'll see to be called an array, a chunk of memory, but they didn't check if the user is trying to get at memory past the amount of memory that they actually have access to. So literally one of the first iPhone exploits whereby someone was able to jailbreak it, that is use it with like a T-Mobile SIM card, was because someone at Apple had made a similar bug such that they didn't check the value of some variable properly and so someone was able to put into memory data that they shouldn't have been allowed to, and in that case code, actual program code that resulted in the iPhone getting opened up. And of course Apple fixed that bug and people find another one. There's something actually in the w Nintendo Wii. I don't know if it's the so-called buffer overflow exploit, but it's similarly a bug. There's some bug in uh, Zelda, Twilight Princess, whereby if you go to a certain screen and do something someone figured out, you can actually insert arbitrary code into the Wii such that you can then start installing your own software on it. Which Nintendo did not like and it's because someone made a bug. So there are very interesting um, if not sophisticated issues that arise simply by not understanding some of these low level details. Well how can we work around this? Well let's take a look at this. So in global.c there's this notion now that's distinct from local variables. So a local variable is one that exists inside the context aka scope of a function. A global variable is one that doesn't. It exists globally outside of the scope, outside of the curly braces of all possible functions. So in fact if we scroll up to the top of this file, notice we've got some comments like usual. We've got a standard library inclusion here. But notice this. You can actually define variables outside of the scope of functions. And by doing this you make them available to any and every function in that file, for better or for worse. Now if I scroll down here, 
notice that x are, is not being declared anymore in main. Notice that main is just using x right away and initializing it obviously to 1. It's then claiming that it's been initialized. It's then telling me what its value is. It's then incrementing dot, dot, dot. It's then calling increment. But now, should this same version of increment work? Yeah, because that variable is defined as a global variable to speak, both increment and main have access to it. And so if I run global after compiling it, what I actually see is that guy does in fact work properly. He's initially zero. He's then incremented to one, initialized to one. It's then incremented and it is in fact two. So we seem to have worked around this and yet this is generally considered bad practice. So just as we sort of give you a new trick, we're taking it away by saying, especially when programs get more complicated, usually using global variables, not a good thing. Either for security purposes, readability purposes, better is to actually pass variables around like, we started to, like we've started to do with arguments. Though there's one curious thing that I've not even mentioned in these examples. What is, um, there appears to be this line of code in between main and in between the int x which is quite coincidentally named the same thing as the function later. So what's the deal with this? Why am I saying void increment up here and also saying it down here? Yeah. Good. You have to in C say that a function exists before you even use it. So C and specifically GCC and C compilers and really preprocessors are not very smart, right? It's not hard for a human to glance at this whole file and realize, oh, there's increment. But if you have not told a function like main that this function exists, it's going to throw up its hands and say, I don't know what that is. In fact, let's see if this works here. So with global, make global it's to recompile it. Ah. So there, I can't even compile the program if I get rid of that function declaration or function prototype as it's called up top. So what's the issue? Well, global.c, line 30, implicit declaration of function increment. Well, what does that mean? Let's go to line 30. So line 30 is the actual line where I call increment. So why is this getting, uh, why am I getting yelled at? Well, let's uh, remove, uh, remove global, recompile this. So warning, implicit declaration of function increment. But notice it is only a warning. So apparently it's not a deal breaker if you don't do this, but you're certainly going to get peppered with warnings. The reason for this is that main doesn't know that the function exists elsewhere in the file. The compiler is that stupid. It doesn't look ahead. Other languages like Java, Perl, PHP are thankfully smart enough to actually do look ahead. But this is why, too, that people in C tend to use these things called .h files. What's a .h file we've talked about thus far? Quick sanity check. Right, so like standard io.h, cs50.h. Well, what does that mean? Well, the reason that all of you guys are able to use the functions like get float and get int and get string that we, the staff, wrote is because at the top of your file, you've been writing things like this, or in the case of our library, things like this. And guess what is inside of cs50.h? Just these so called declarations of functions, just these prototypes. In fact, if I go to the URL here, you'll have it for reference on Wednesday. If I go to cs50.net uh, and go to our software page, you'll see that there's a link here to CS50's library. So let's go click the download link. You'll never have to, most of you will never have to download this actual link because we make it available on the system for you. But this file called cs50.h, it looks like this. And next week we'll actually tease some of this apart. But notice there's not much code. There's huge blocks of comments which are meant to be instructive and tell other people how to use this library. But other than that, we define get double and then semicolon. We don't actually implement it. Get float, semicolon. Get int, semicolon. That's it. There's no real code, no implementation here because that code is actually in a separate file. And we've done some tricks to actually make that file available to you. But the point is that you're able to use these functions because you can separate a function's implementation from its declaration or its prototype. And by prototype, we very simply mean its return value followed by its name, followed by parenthetically the types of arguments that it takes. So what can we now use this for? Well, let's take a look lastly at buggy 5. So in buggy 5, in buggy 5.c, what is going to happen here? 
Well, should increment a variable but doesn't. Can you find the bug? So let's take a look. Here's the main routine. And we seem to be saying x is now such and such, initializing, that define x as equaling 1. So x is a global, so that's good. So let's see if the bug is in increment. So what's going on? Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of obvious here, but it does illustrate an interesting point. So clearly, I am declaring inside of increment a variable that also is called x, but I'm initializing its value to 10. Then I'm doing plus plus. What just got plus plus? Well, that copy of x. So it is now 11, but what happened to this variable here? Well, when you have two variables that are identically named in different scopes, the one that has been most recently defined or declared rather in between the most recent copies of curly braces is the one that takes priority. So in fact, yes, this can have the same name, in this case x, but that quote unquote shadows the other variable or any other variable in scope that has the same name. So you just don't have access to that global variable. So what's the solution to this? Right, so don't use the same name. And frankly, it's as simple as that. But this is one of the sort of gotchas that arises when you start using global variables because if you have collisions of names and C is not very good about letting you distinguish one scope from another manually. So let's now actually return some value and make this more clear. Because thus far, we've been using like swap and increment, but they've only had side effects, so to speak. They've not, either not worked at all, they've been buggy, or they've just printed something out or tried to change something, but they've not yet returned something. So if we look instead at return1.c, notice that this function here is a little more sophisticated, right? Side effects generally not smiled upon because it's a little nicer uh, when writing code, especially a lot of it, if it's much more clear what a function is doing and not letting functions change variables on you without you really realizing it, generally not a good thing. So better practice might be declare x to be initialized to 1, then call increment sure, and pa but pass it in the variable that you want to change. Now, yes, you're passing in a copy, to be clear from before, but what is x, what is increment actually doing? Well, it's taking that variable, which it just nicknames or renames a, but it's a copy, so that's fine. And then it returns a plus 1. So, so long as I remember what that value is, I'm sort of good to go. Does it matter in this case that x has, a copy of x has been passed in to increment? Yes? No? No, because I'm passing in a copy, yes, but then I'm getting back sort of a new version of that number, and which one am I remembering? The new version. So it doesn't matter that it was just, in fact, a copy. The bits were, in fact, the same. And if you look at uh, return 2.c, it's something similar in spirit. But there was something that I glossed over earlier. In beer 3.c, I had this crazy syntax, which is actually kind of useful. What in the world does, do these two lines of code seem to be doing toward the bottom of beer3.java? It's the sort of ternary operator. Yeah? Um, if S1, um, it sets S1 to either bottle or bottle, then again, Yeah, so it was around the time that I wrote the third version of this program that I realized, um, one, I was kind of cutting corners, and two, I wasn't really being very anal. Right? It's very easy in a program to not have to worry about plurality or singularity by just saying uh, bottles per parenthetical s. Right? I can kind of deal with the bad grammar just by saying yeah, parenthesize the s. Right? And you can think of other kinds of examples where you might want to cut this corner. But now by the third version of this thing I was thinking, all right, I kind of have the ability to program. A computer should be able to fix this for me. In fact, if we run beer 3, what we'll get after compiling it is a slightly more sophisticated one that gets the grammar right. So two, three bottles of beer, two bottles of beer, one bottle of beer. How did I do that? Well, you can very easily imagine using what kind of construct to do bottles or bottle, depending on the value of some variable. It's just an if. If positive, say bottles. If, ne oh, if um, singular, or if equals equals one, print out bottle instead. But there turns out there's this other syntax. So to be clear, we could do this. If I wanted to define a string, just to be clear, called S1, and that string is going to be the word that I want to plug in, I could do something like this. If I equals equals one, I want to set this string equal to the string bottle. Else, I want to set that string that I'm going to plug into printf later to the plural, bottles, bottles, 
Okay, and done. So sort of very simple, very scratch-like, but if you want to start to get a bit leet or a little fancy, you can do the exact same thing with these one-liners. So what this line is saying, S1 gets either the thing after the question mark or the thing after the colon, depending on the truth value of this expression. So it's just sort of a slick or confusing, depending on how you view the world, way of doing exactly the same thing. So it's just yet another way to accomplish that. Well, let me bring up one point about uh, greed. So in greedy and in the optimal problem, in problem set one, where you're tasked with figuring out exactly how many coins need to be returned to some customer, you will quite likely trip over some of the imprecisions that are floats and doubles. So in fact, let me go ahead and write really on the fly here, bar.c, it's just a demo pr uh, purpose. I'm going to do include standard io.h so that I can use printf. I'm going to just type verbatim this string, which will start to tease apart on Wednesday. And now I just want to do something simple. First, I'm going to tell the user, uh, give me a float, just to have a nice little interface. Then I'm going to do float f gets get float. Oh, if I want to use this, I need to go back and do what? Right, I need to go back and fix this. I'll be anal and alphabetize them, but it doesn't matter in this case. Now I'm going to print out print f percent uh, f new line, and then this value f. But you know what? I'd really like, I don't want to see the default number of decimal points. Give me a lot. Like, I want to see 20 decimal points of precision, because I really want to see what's going inside this variable called f. All right, so if I didn't make any mistakes, I'm going to go ahead and save that. I'm going to make um, bar, just again, arbitrary name today. And now I'm going to run bar, give me a float. How about, uh, uh, let's say, 10 cents. So the context here is money. Ooh. Ooh. So this is good in the like Superman 3 or office space sense, right? If variables aren't actually stored precisely, but let's see what's, what's going on. If you have no idea what I just said, Google it. Um, <laughs> give me a float for one. Well, that's kind of worrisome. If again, my goal here is to implement the notion of a cash register, how about a dollar? Okay, thankfully that's at least right. What about 50 cents? 50 cents seems to be right. What about $3.40? Yeah, so it seems that even though floats are 32 bits, that doesn't give you, needless to say, an infinite amount of precision. And so there's this inherent imprecision in computers themselves about using floating point values, whether you use floats or slightly better, doubles, which use more bits. Because again, as we said last week, at the end of the day, if you only have a finite amount of memory, you can't truly represent real numbers or floating point values precisely. The computer's got to kind of cut corners somewhere. And so the suggestion we give you in the problem set is relatively simple, but even then fraught with a potential gotcha still. How can you go about counting change precisely so that you don't end up losing a penny or giving out an answer that's off by one? Well, cents is kind of a nice unit to work in. So take these dollar amounts, like $3.41, multiply it by 100 to move that decimal point over two places, because at least the theme seems to be that the uh, Superman 3 remainders seem to be way out there on the right. So just moving that decimal point over and then grabbing the 341 cents that $3.41 represents might actually help you avoid this, but not necessarily perfectly. So with that teaser, we'll give you problem set one. We'll see you on Wednesday.